Welcome to the Amazing Grace Talk podcast. Conversations that explore how God has pursued those he has made in his image. My wife and host, Erica C. Meyer Williamson, is on a journey to meet everyday people who have experienced a radical encounter with the divine presence of unconditional love. These are the stories that remind us why God's grace is amazing. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my podcast. My name is Erica, and I'm so glad you stopped by. It is my hope that through the amazing testimonies you will hear on this show, will plant a seed in your heart and ignite your dreams all for God's glory. Through much prayer and listening to God's direction, I actually retired from a 30-year career in 2020 to spend more time doing just that, helping women find clarity, overcome struggles, and discover their true calling. In 2016, I launched the Amazing Grace Retreats in the beautiful Black Hills of South Dakota. Started this podcast in September of last year, and in the spring, I will finish my autobiography, a book that shares my struggles and victories to prove that anyone can live in God's amazing grace for those who believe in Him. I can't wait to see you at the next retreat. On today's episode of Amazing Grace Talk podcast, we have got none other than my producer, Rob Price, who is multi-talented, um, and we also have my sidekick, Robin, here today, and um, so welcome, you two. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. You got, it's Rob, Rob and Robin. I like Rock it. And Rob, Robin. Rock and Robin. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was you about know, to say. my given name is Robin, so you have two Robins on your show today. Oh, really? I just go by Rob. Really? Yeah. Rock and Robin and Sissy. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Back to the show. Um, but so today what we're going to be discussing is, so Rob wrote a book years ago. How many years ago? Well, I was back in 2013. It's okay. been about seven years now. Yeah. We love when he comes on the show and puts in his two cents. Sometimes we just even pause and get a word of wisdom. Um, so we're excited to have him on the show today because of that. He's got a lot of wisdom and it's just, you know, you have such a teaching spirit. I think that's what we love, you know, Robin and I, right, Robin, we yes. just, we're like, just want to soak it in. Like, what is he going to say next? Before I get started, how did this topic of covenants yeah. come about? Well, I was saved at age five, received the Spirit's baptism at age 13, been a Christian most of my life, went to Christian school and went to many chapels and many Sunday mm -hmm. schools and many church services, Bible studies time in the word, but I, no one ever taught me about the word covenant. But it wasn't until in the mid nineties when I began to hear a radio show from a guy named Malcolm Smith that I began to understand what on earth have I got myself into when I said yes to Jesus. Yeah. Because I began to realize this guy's talking about the gospel is about a blood covenant. Mm -hmm. And he began to teach what a covenant is really is. And it blew my mind. I thought covenant was just a fancy word for an agreement. Like in marriage. A promise. A uh, yeah. Uh, a contract. But it's way deeper than that. And it put mm -hmm. me on a journey, Erica and Robin, on a, this path of finding out what is this new covenant all about? Yeah. It so transformed my thinking and my walk with God. It changed everything about how I viewed my prayer life, my faith life, my marriage, how mm -hmm. I view the body of Christ, how I view the word of God, how I view who God is, the very nature of God. And I'd been a Christian since age five. It yeah. felt like I was almost reborn, if I can say that carefully. How old were you time. around that time? I was probably in my early 20s. Yeah. Just out of college, just married. I'm on the road a lot driving to Dallas from Waxahachie. Mm -hmm. So I have 50 minutes one way, 50 minutes back, a lot of time in the car on a radio show or playing cassette tapes back. Yes, we had cassette tapes back in the day. <laughs> you remember those days? At least it wasn't the eight track <laughs> tape. That would really be going back. I just could not get enough yeah. of the word of God. You know, in fact, I'm ashamed to say it, but the Bible I have in front of me on this table today <laughs> was in my lap and I would read the Bible going down I-45. Oh no. I'm a horrible <laughs> driver. Why am I confessing this on the podcast? I don't know, but I hey, that's, that's just, just as bad as text <laughs> texting while you're driving. Hey, we've seen an, we saw an old man in downtown Dallas reading the newspaper once. So oh, hey, I guess bad. people do it. 
Hey, we'll talk about what a covenant is, but it really helped my walk be solidified to, mm-hmm. to know why I believe what I believe, yeah. to understand the guts of the Bible. Because you see, Erica and Robin, when you're a little kid, you sing that song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, that's fine when you're six years old, but when you're 25, 24, that's just not good enough anymore. Yeah. Just because the Bible tells me so. <laughs> and and then, so I understand Jesus, how does he love me? Well, the Bible says he died for my sins. And I get that to a point. I understand that forgiveness of sins, but but why? Mm-hmm. Why couldn't he just said, now let's stop doing that. God doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't just give it a second pass or a hall pass. The covenant put everything into focus and began to see even the Bible is a series of covenants from the Adamic covenant, mm-hmm. clear down through the new covenant, Abraham's, Moses's, David's, it goes right down the line. God deals with covenant because he is covenant. Mm-hmm. My life verse, in fact, is, is a covenantal verse. Psalm 25, 14, friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. Think about that for a second. In order to be a friend, and friend's a covenant word. We'll get to these words later on. But Mm -hmm. friendship with the Lord is only reserved for those who fear him. Then the Bible says, to those those who fear him, he makes known his covenant. He reveals to them his covenant. So as we talk about this, even covenant revelation, there's a certain gate where if we're not in a place of reverence toward God, He won't reveal it to us. Now, wait a minute. Let's go back on that. He won't reveal it to us. (laughs) That is God says, he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if someone has an arrogant, haughty spirit, a prideful spirit, the Bible says God won't even show you his covenant. In other words, and Jesus said this. He says, why would I cast my pearls before swine? So in order to get covenant revelation, you can't be flippant about it. It's such a sacred truth that unless your heart is in the right position to receive mm-hmm. the gospel, mm-hmm. the gospel seems to be like foolish, right? Mm-hmm. It seems stupid. So when you have a humble heart, a fearful, reverent heart, God says, oh, I can trust you with this, this awesome revelation. So it's my life verse. So I promise God I will teach it and preach it anytime I can. Because it is literally the gospel message. It, wow. That's how I view it. Now, other folks view the gospel differently, but I've been so transformed by this message that it, if the Bible makes sense to me. Every sentence makes sense. When you say yeah. life verse, what do you mean by that? It's that. a guiding force verse that it's the main reason I think I am alive on the, on the earth. You know, we all have different gifts and callings, and some people are really big. Like one of your guests on the previous podcast is really about healthcare justice and reform, Miss mm-hmm. Do- Donna Smith. Mm-hmm. Well, she made like a Bible verse about justice mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and uh, reform. So we all have our own natural way to express God's image to the world. Mm-hmm. And so that verse for me, Robin, has been a guiding light. I never want to lose reverence for God. And I want to reveal his covenant to as many people who want to listen to it because it so changed my but life. But when so. you say your life verse, you're saying that when you read it, it became life it, it, to oh you. Oh my gosh. Mm. When I read that Is verse. Is that what you meant? Yes. Like, then, like how did he, did he find it? Select it. Select yes. yes. Yeah. Well, and there's different versions. And the book talks about in the book called The Blood Covenant, with the subtitle, The Story of God's Extraordinary Love for You, the, the, the verse has several options to look at from the Amplified says the secret of the sweet, satisfying companionship of the Lord have they who fear and revere and worship him. He will show them his covenant and reveal to them its deep inner meaning. Like the NLT says, friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. With them, he shares the secrets of his covenant. So even the Bible says there's something really extra special about this almost secretive. It's not Gnostic. It's not secret knowledge that only a few can obtain, it's for everyone. But you've got to be in the right heart position yeah. or God simply will not reveal it to you. It, only those who fear him is this revelation reserved for. Now, what exactly does that mean when you're fearing the Lord? In the New Testament, 
Ananias and Sapphira drop dead. This is in the New Testament because they did not reverence and fear the Lord. They thought they could take advantage of him with the whole money situation mm. about selling some land and only giving part of it. And they lied to the yeah. Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that great fear came upon the church. I tell people, if you've never had a holy scare of God's presence, I question if you're ever even really a mature Christian. At mm-hmm. some point, it's a healthy thing to know that I am just a small little C creature. Mm-hmm. And he's capital C creator. Yeah. And my salvation is in his hand. He is my judge. Mm-hmm. Now, thanks be to God because my sin has been judged through the blood of Jesus because I'm in covenant <laughs> with Jesus. He died for me and as me as my covenant representative. But until I know that, I, there's got to be a sense of reverence mm-hmm. for God that is almost, not that you're scared of God, but you're in awe of him. Like, can, like, like it's in awe of him, like breathless, speechless. But what about like when you are convicted, like God convicts you of things? Is that similar at all? Absolutely. So you're... Because if we continue to walk in sin, the Bible says if we deliberately continue to sin after receiving a knowledge of the truth, Mm -hmm. there is no sacrifice left for sins, but only an expectation of fearful judgment. And it says it's a dreadful thing, the Bible says, to fall into the hands of the living God. That's in Hebrews, I think, 13. Yeah. 13. This is New Testament, Erica. This is not just (laughs) Old Testament. Open up, open up, open up the earth and down goes Korah. (laughs) Okay. I think we've gotten away from some of this that, We need to not take grace and make it so cheap. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about cheap grace. And the covenant revelation helps us understand that grace is costly. Mm -hmm. It costs Jesus his life. So, Rob, let's get into the details of what exactly is a covenant and why it is such an important topic for the body of Christ to understand. Okay. So the word covenant in Hebrew is berit. B-R-I-T, it, has, it comes across in English, has berit. If you break down the Hebrew letters, mm-hmm. by the letters, it's just fascinating. It means to cut until blood flows. So in its very DNA of its definition, the word covenant has the idea of bloodshed in the very Hebraic words in the letters, okay? But when you spell the word out, berit, mm-hmm. the word means to bind together. To bind something, so wait a minute, something's being cut, there's bloodshed, so something's being separated, but the word means in the end of the game, it is a binding together. So when you put the full context in the Bible, what the word covenant means, it's this, a binding obligation of love and commitment between two parties into a permanent union that can only be separated by death. A covenant it's not just a handshake. A handshake was, is a form of a symbol of a covenant. That's where they came from, the handshake. We'll get to that later. But the word covenant means a binding obligation of love and commitment to somebody else, either a party, an individual, into a permanent union that you just can't flippantly undo. It can only be separated by death. So I learned there's no such thing as a casual covenant. You don't enter to covenant lightly. A covenant is not a contract. A contract is written in ink. It's the exchange of goods, services, products. They can be negotiated. They can be changed, annulled, whatever. Mm -hmm. Not so a covenant. Covenant is the exchange of someone's life for somebody else's life. And you enter into it by blood. Jesus Christ made a blood covenant with us of love and commitment. He bound together two parties, the Godhead and us. (laughs) We're going to take a brief moment away from this podcast and tell you about our sponsor for today. It's Blue Diamond Roofing Construction. It's actually my husband, Eric Williamson. He is a man of God who serves, loves to serve people. And honey, tell us what sets you apart of other roofers or other construction. Tell us about that. 
Well, we are not the roofers that are going to come and knock on your door and harass you wanting to sell you something that you don't need. We are going to look out for your best interest, what's going to work best for your house, your income, whatever. We have different levels of materials, shingles. We do windows, gutters, painting, siding, flooring, basically anything that you need at your home we can handle for you. Okay. How are we going to reach you? Well, you can call our office at 469-360-1578. Uh, you can email us at eric, uh, bdrc at gmail.com. That's Eric with a K. Yes, Eric with a K. Yeah. <laughs> yep. To come out and take a look or give an estimate, there is no charge for that. Okay. Um, if you have emergency repairs where you have a storm, a tree falls, you've got a hole in your roof, whatever, you can call us. We have 24 hour, seven day a week uh, emergency repairs. Awesome. Well. All right. Might take us away from our chicken dinner, but hey, he's there to serve. <laughs> thanks, everybody. We'll put the contact information in the show notes. And thanks, honey. And back to our show today. In fact, what's cool about the gospel is I don't have the ability to keep my side of a covenant. God the Father made a covenant with God the Son and included me in the promises. Wow. He included me. I just say yes. Mm -hmm. I don't have to work or earn or twist God's arm to make him love me or do a list of things right correctly. There's no scales like the, our, our Muslim friends believe life is a scale. And if you do 51% good works, you get to go to heaven. And if <laughs> it's 49% good works, you go to hell. That's uh-huh. not what the gospel teaches. The gospel is that God so loved the world, he literally gave his own begotten son as a covenant sacrifice. Mm-hmm. But when I began to realize it has nothing to do with me but my response of, yes, I, I believe that by faith. In fact, I can't even generate in my own spirit the faith to believe this. God gives me the gift of faith to believe the gospel. In fact, I can't even repent of my own choice. The Bible says, do you not know that God's kindness leads you to repentance? So now I have a real problem here in the flesh. I can't even repent on my own. It's a gift of God. So repentance and faith are itself a gift from God that points me to the gospel which is covenant. And what the, this did for me was it, it made me understand a little bit more about the gears and the mechanics of how the gospel actually works. Like, mm-hmm. okay, so Jesus had to die for me to forgive sin. How and why did that work? Why couldn't he have just died another way? Is there a reason why he had to go to the cross mm-hmm. and say certain things that he said on the cross? Why, why couldn't he have just sent an angel in the sky and said, believe upon this Jesus angel right. and, and look upon him every day and cross your, cross your heart five times and you're, you're in? No, God was cutting a covenant. In fact, the Bible says before the beginning of time, there was a covenant, an everlasting covenant, an eternal covenant. It's almost as if God knew we were going to blow it. So before he even said, let us make man, before time began, had Jesus lined up to be our Savior as our covenant representative. Now, we need to go into the steps of a covenant. Okay. This is super, super important. So there are certain steps that they would make in ancient historical covenants, and this helps us understand the gospel. In order for a covenant to happen between two people, two nations, two parties, first of all, you would need the promises. What are the terms? So let's say we have two, a farmer family and a warrior family. They say, wait a minute, why don't you farm for us? And we'll protect you. Like, it, it can be mutually beneficial. Okay. That's one type of a covenant. It, it benefited both parties. That was a unilateral covenant. Mm-hmm. Other covenants in Scripture and in history were, were unequal, where a greater Lord would impose a covenant upon a lesser Lord, meaning, do it my way or I'll kill you. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Uh, with, with Zedekiah, the, the, mm-hmm. the, the puppet king of Israel. When, when Zedekiah uh, broke covenant, his eyes are gouged out, right? He sees his own sons die, and, and it's bad news, and they go off into captivity. So any covenant has a promise of the terms, the agreement. What, what do you get? What do I get? Mm-hmm. It's in any covenant, okay? Number two, there's a representative. This is so important. Whenever you make a covenant, there's a ceremony. 
each party has to bring forth one person to stand in the gap and represent everyone else. And so what you'd say was at the ceremony, let's say Robin was representing uh, all the women of the world. And what you're about to say, it's as if all the women of the world are saying it. What happens to Robin happens to Erica and happens to Erica Lane and every other female in the world. So there's a lot of weight, a lot of burden upon you because it happens to you. So therefore, you could actually say, in the name of Robin, we're in covenant. We have these rights, these protective rights. We're going to farm for them. We're going to, they're going to take care of us. So isn't it funny how the Bible talks a lot about in the name of Jesus? Mm-hmm. That's not just a courteous a saying. Uh, saying. It is covenantal. And so when you pray in the name of Jesus, every demon has to flee because mm-hmm. they know you are calling upon a covenant king because you are literally in Christ. That's another phrase. In the Bible, you'll see it over and over, together with Christ, in Christ, through Christ. That's because, oh, because he's my covenant representative. That's why. Mm -hmm. So you see, the whole Bible begins to put on a whole other filter. In fact, it changed how I read my Bible. I read the Bible 100% of the time through the covenant filter, almost like a pair of sunglasses. That's how I see scripture. It's, I think it just changed for me right then. I'm serious. I just, I just <laughs> So they also would do exchanges. They would exchange coats and garments, meaning all I am, my belongings belong to you. They would exchange weapons. My fighting strength is yours. They would exchange names. Their names are mixed together. In fact, in marriage, we the, the female usually takes on the name of the male. That's covenantal, all right? And then uh, this is so funny because John 16 said, whatever you ask for the father in my name, he will give you Mm -hmm. in my name. They shall cast out devils in my name. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And this is so cool. I love this one. One of the last things they would do in ancient covenants, get ready for the goosebumps. (laughs) The two representatives would exchange their firstborn sons. What? Let that sink in a minute the two representatives would exchange their eldest sons. Isn't it interesting that God gave his only begotten son? He literally gave his own son. When Abraham gives up Isaac, Mm -hmm. he's about to slay him. And the angel stops the knife, right? Mm -hmm. And God says, now I know because you have not withheld from me your one and only son. I am obligated to a human being because of covenant to not withhold my son from Abraham, Jesus Christ. Because one covenant in the Bible is the Abrahamic covenant. Through your seed, I'll bless the whole earth. And through Abraham's seed, we see the line of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But it had to be tested. And it's the only time in history we see in the Bible where a man put God in the corner. Here we have... Abraham is giving his only son, and now God is under covenant obligation. In that moment, our destiny was sealed. That's why we call Abraham the father of our faith. Remember when you were a kid, Father Abraham had many sons, (laughs) and many sons had Father Abraham. (laughs) When Abraham said, how shall I know you'll give me this this land and and, and these, 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 these kiddos? He's like, God says, go bring me a heifer, and he mentions other animals. In that moment, Abraham said, he's going to cut a covenant with me. Because back then it was common. Making covenants were very normal and common. In today's westernized 21st century American church, we don't know what this is. Mm -hmm. We, We have no awareness of its fact in biblical history. Abraham, clear through through the Apostle Paul, because his language is littered with covenant language in the New Testament. These friends of ours in the Bible, they knew it was their natural course of action. They knew what a covenant was. So when Abraham's told by God to get a bunch of animals, and the Bible says he laid him out there, and Abraham knew just what to do. He cut him in half. Because the next the next few steps in our ceremony is once you have a promise and a representative and exchange, then you would cut an animal in half. Oftentimes it was a heifer, a goat, a ram, a lamb was cut in half many times. Jesus is the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the earth. 
they would take a mark on their body and they would they would in, intentionally let it fester so that the representative would have a permanent scar on their right hand and they would raise their right hands and give vows in the middle of that bloody ram or lamb sacrifice. It's a sobering reminder that covenants aren't made. You don't make a covenant. You cut a covenant because blood is shed. Your own blood is shed. Isn't it interesting? The only visible scars of the beating he endured are the two scars on his hands. He showed Thomas. He said, Mm -hmm. look at the scars. That was Jesus' mark on the body because he was the covenant representative for mankind. And forever and ever and ever in heaven, you'll be able to look upon your Savior, Erica and Robin. In, in heaven, you'll be able to see Jesus' hands will bear the covenant scars for all eternity when he died for you and he died as you. Then they would do the walk of death. They would walk through the bloody entrails. These representatives would walk through. And while they're walking through it, they would raise their hands. They would call upon a god, or many times a pagan god, if, because even pagans would make covenants. They'd call upon God and they'd say, I will keep this covenant. Remember, blood, their own blood's dripping down their arm. They're standing in a pool of lamb blood. There's dozens, maybe hundreds of people watching. They'd raise their right hand. They would say this, I will keep this covenant even if my blood must be shed. And if I break or fail to keep this covenant, may what happened to this animal happen to me. Think about that. You've just locked yourself into this thing. I will keep it unto death. I will die protecting your lands, the warriors would say to the farmers. I will die on the hill because you, you're now my covenant partner because I love you. I choose to love you. I will die for you. And if I one day flake out and run away, I call upon the God who's watching over this covenant to strike me dead. If I fail to keep this covenant, may what happened to this animal happen to me and everyone with me. You're locked in. There is no way out of a covenant. When you're in, you're in. When I said to my wife at my wedding vows, at the end, you say, till what? Till death do us part. Mm -hmm. I still get weepy. When I go to weddings, because it's a reminder to me, I get to watch two people making a covenant. Mm -hmm. They're cutting a covenant. And not to be too graphic, but when the marriage is consummated, blood is shed. That's why God takes the sexual act so serious. It's a covenantal act. Mm -hmm. Save yourself for your marriage covenant. Save your body, your temple, for the covenant. So they say the vows. They have the walk of death. They have the blood sacrifice with the lamb, with the ram, and the goat. They've got their mark on the body. Then they would set up memorials, trees, rocks, wells, to always remember that location. And then they would end with a meal. And don't you know the meal would always be bread and wine? (laughs) Isn't it funny that Jesus, when he's the covenant meal, the communion supper is the bread and wine. The (laughs) body is the bread and Mm -hmm. the wine is the blood. When Jesus said, Robin, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. A new covenant. Okay. Is that the second half of the Bible? Is that chapter two of of of, of the scriptures? No. It just looks like it. The word new in Greek is amazing. The word new in Greek means original, uncommon, unprecedented and unheard of. So Jesus said, basically, I'm going to make a blow your mind covenant. I'm going to do something you've never even conceived of. It's a new covenant. Well, what's new about it? Here's what's new about it. For the first time in the history of covenant making, a single human being will be both the covenant representative and the covenant sacrifice at the same time my mind is still blown and I've been teaching this for 25 years. How can a single human being be both the covenant representative and the covenant sacrifice at the same, this, this is unheard of. This is, oh, that's why Jesus said it's a new covenant. 
I'm going to blow your mind at how much I love you. Our conversation went a little longer than we thought, so we decided to make it into a two-part podcast. And so we'll pick up this conversation on the next episode of Amazing Grace Talk. And thanks to all of our listeners who remind me daily through text, emails, and phone calls of how listening to the podcast has impacted their lives. If you would like to be considered as a guest on our show, please email me at ericaseemeyer at gmail.com or message me on social media at Erica Seymour Williamson. For more information on the upcoming retreat schedule, check out www.amazinggraceretreats.com in the show notes. And I look forward to seeing you and meeting you at our next getaway. And last but not least, we would be so honored if you would write a review, subscribe to the show, and share this podcast on your social media. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next time on Amazing Grace Talk.